Welcome to On Texas Football. It's State of the Program. I'm Bobby Burton, joined by C.J. Vogel and Jerry Hamilton. We're literally uh, steps away from the U University of Texas football facility. We just got finished with a uh, media availability. Instead of Steve Sarkeesian today, C.J. and Jerry, we actually got David Benda and Quinn Ewers, uh, both young men uh, acquitting themselves well in front of the cameras today, uh, talking a lot about leadership. And I, I think as you guys know, uh, the State of the Program always brought to you by uh, Adam Lowy and the Lowy Law Firm. One of the things that we wanted to talk about as it relates to this in this segment of State of the Program is leadership. David Benda, CJ, started talking about it. Not only is he trying to lead, but he's talking about Quinn and other guys, Baron Sorrell, uh, Jade Baron, those guys becoming leaders, as well as some of the younger guys trying to step, step up too. Yeah, I thought it was certainly interesting that these were the two guys that Texas gave first availability to this spring. You know, over the past years, you'll probably get two, maybe three per week of the team. For David Benda to be that guy, as for Quinn Ewers, as the quarterback of this team, to be those first guys out of the gate for the media, I think speaks a lot about how they're received behind the scenes in the locker room and also how the coaching staff uh, really likes their moxie in, in the way that they approach the team at the moment. Uh, David Benda, to me, I thought, really embraced taking that, that leadership role and filling that void that we saw from a Jalen Ford, a Devondre Sweat, uh, even Ryan Watts to an extent last year as well. Uh, Texas is looking for that. There's a lot of new faces, a lot of people expected to take leaps this year. David Benda right now is that guy that I'm looking at as you know going to be that one of those big captains. It's clear Sark thinks so. Right. At the very least, I would add this. Um, he talked about it being a younger team this year, Jerry. Uh, and I thought that was very interesting because we've talked about it being a younger team. Right. And at the same time, he's like, look, we were 12 inch, 12 yards away from playing for a national championship. And we were talking about motivation and what what he needed out of that. He said that was motivation enough. No, no. But also he went he hearkened back. He goes, he's, I, he's been there a long time. Right. Jerry, he's talking about how in my how he came from a time when they weren't winning many ball games, and now they are. And he has no intention of going backwards. Right. <laughs> that was well, look, look, here's something to remember about Benda, too. He, he's a Cinco Ranch guy. He always played second fiddle to Katie High. Right. The, so that feeds that again for him. Right. I mean, he, he's he's not second fiddle at Texas, but the, to my point. They were, told, like you said, 12 seconds away. And I really do believe this is – no coaching job is easy, but this is going to be the the easiest coaching job Sark has had since he's been at Texas because there's so many guys that were close to climbing the mountaintop, but they didn't quite get there. And that includes Nye Black, Blackshire, and Isaiah Bond, all kids that went through Alabama had won national championships until this last couple of classes. So those guys are rare at Al when they were at Alabama. They don't already have a ring. So they're coming in uh, with a year left of college probably in all three uh, cases. And, you know, look, it, it, it's the same. This is a great time to be and a great year to be Steve Sarkeesian and the staff. And he also has enough new blood, new energy on that staff, Johnny Nansen, Kenny Baker. Not that there's anything wrong with the guys that departed, but some fresh new energy as well. Um, I mean, I think the uh, coaching turnover, Nick Saban, sometimes did that for energy reasons, right? Kickstart, kickstart that thing in. So uh, it's just interesting to me. I, I, I'll tell you what, good news uh, for, for Texas players, uh, based on what Sark said, that Trey Moore wasn't the first guy brought to the mic. <laughs> so that means there's still good leadership from guys returning in the program. I, I'm, I was impressed by, by David Ben today. I really was. He, he just well-spoken, honest. I mean, we I asked him a question about what he wanted to improve coming back on pass defense. I mean, he didn't, he didn't hide behind that at all block destruction, things like that, that he really wanted to, to go to the next level on. At the same time, he was genuinely talking about how, I mean, look, he described Jarrett Gibson and Christian Clark uh, as two peas in a pod that are always in the weight room together. It's clear that David Benda is not just about David Benda. Right. If that makes sense. He's talking about the entire team. He's looking at the whole team. He's talking about the secondary. He's talking about the defensive line in front of him. The, he, I felt like David Benda, and he's he's right. He's he is in his sixth year, so he should be a little bit this way. 
but it was it was a little more honest and genuine than I've seen other guys get up in front of the mic and talk about other positions, that sort of stuff. I thought I thought he was terrific. Yeah, yeah. Great, thing, great thing about Ben to too, what he said about those freshmen. The only way you know who's in the weight room all the time is if you're there to see it. Yeah, <laughs> that's a great point. <laughs> Otherwise, it's BS. <laughs> yeah. Uh, there, there was a, a moment or a word that he used that I think in previous Texas years, probably before Sarkeesian, and he's done a great job since he's got here, but he used the word, the term clicky. And he's, he basically said, you know, we don't really see that anymore. And I think that goes back to last year a little bit with the implementation of those trust circles and those trust groups that Sarkeesian and the staff kind of implemented and having those guys kind of buy into it being a family, playing for each other, and look at where it took the team, obviously. Uh, the other thing, and, and you go back to being just 12 inches short of playing for a national championship and the way that Benda phrased it is playing for history, right? Like you could have changed the outcome of college football history with, uh, you know, coming up one foot short just a little bit. He said, you know, this offseason, I was, I was pissed off. And I thought that was a really interesting phrase because I think for most Texas fans, you want to hear that. You want to hear that because you got so close – you know, you, you want to climb that mountaintop, as you said, Jerry, but David Bendis certainly mentioned it, and I loved what I heard from the Texas defensive captain. Yeah, absolutely. All right, we're going to talk a little bit next about Quinn Ewers and what he had to say, as well as what we saw a little bit in practice today from Ewers and others uh, as well in this episode of State of the Program. But first, we want to say thank you to Adam Lowy and the Lowy Law Firm. Adam and his group for 20-plus years have been helping Austin's uh, Austinites and others around the state uh, if they've been injured in a car wreck, an accident, motor, motorbike, et cetera, give Adam and his his group a chance to earn your business. Uh, contact them at lowylawfirm.com. They give you a free uh, consultation. If you just call them, they'll let you know whether or not they think you ha have a claim uh, that they want to get after. All right. Hey, let's talk about Quinn Ewers next, Jerry. I think this is important. Uh, I asked Quinn a question about uh, how he's, transfer or how he's progressed over the last 24 months? Oh, man. Uh, I've grown a whole lot in every aspect of quarterbacking. Um, you know, my first year, the woods were turning pretty fast. So it's, it's finally last year slowed down, and now I can can really play the quarterback position how I'm supposed to be played this year, I feel like. Yeah, so look, with Quinn, I, I think we've talked about this a lot. What What's interesting to me is, He's going to be more comfortable this year. I think the world's slowing down for Quinn. I think the world was moving so fast for him. It's interesting. Uh, just like Rob Lanier was talk, talk, asked yesterday at Rice Press Conference about recruiting TJ Ford, and he talked about how that, the football, basketball was his only world at that time. Uh, and, and that kind of struck me, and it kind of makes sense, so much sense with Quinn is – is that his world has never really had a chance to slow down. I think until right now, you go from being one of the number one ranked prospect in the country in your junior class, leaving high school early, going to Ohio State, transferring to Texas. Um, you're in a quarterback battle at Texas. He wasn't, but let's just say he was. Um, so that Hudson Card stayed for the season. There wasn't a battle. and But then still, you're in a battle, so you don't take a leadership role. Things are moving fast. This is three systems in three years, whether it's Riley Dodge's, Ohio State's, or Texas. And Steve Sarkeesian's system is really demanding. And then you have the whole NIL world coming at you at Texas. But and then most importantly, Bobby, we've talked about this. There are very few guys that understand the pressure of taking a – here's the football. There's 108,000 fans in DKR. And your expectation is to win a conference championship and lead Texas to the college football playoff. There aren't a lot of guys that have handled that well over the years. So if you put all that together, his world should be slowing down right now. He's in a comfortable place. I think he's comfortable in his skin. I think he's comfortable in his uh, at the university. I think he's comfortable in Steve Sarkeesian's system. Uh, he has more confidence than ever. I think he's com I think he's comfortable with his body now. He's stronger. I think last year, look, I talked to some people. Is he stripped down that weight and? That was a good start to that, but there were some concerns about having enough strength to hold up. So now, if you put all of it together, his world is slowing down for him. 
And I think that's why we're going to see the best season we, we've had from Quinn at Texas. And that, and, and that doesn't mean he's going to go out and complete 77, 78%. That's not happening in Steve Sarkeesian's system. It's not. Tua completed 69 and 71% with four first-round picks at wide receiver. It's too much of a downfield timing offense that requires offensive line to protect for longer periods of time, right? So there's more maybe off-schedule rush throws at times in the system. But he's as comfortable as he's ever been. And that could mean 71% completions again, but it doesn't matter. I think you're going to see a more comfortable, confident Quinn Ewers next year. Yeah, Jerry, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned things slowing down for Quinn because he even mentioned that himself. He's like, you know, for my entire life, basically, since yeah. I've you know, kind of became uh, a spotlight on the recruiting trail, I've sped up it. You know, I've rushed getting to college. I've rushed at my time at Ohio State. Now I'm at Texas, and things, like you said, are – Starting to slow down, and I think he understands that a little bit. He said he, had, he felt like he had great command of this offense as well, as you would expect in year three as a starting quarterback here. Uh, to me, you know, as, as, as quickly as he can get acclimated to his weapons on the outside, which he said Isaiah Bond actually ran a similar system at Alabama, so it's kind of been a seamless transition there. You know, I, I think Quinn Ewers, as you said, is going to put up the best numbers that we've seen from him and be the most confident when – uh, not only on the field, but in the locker room where he's expected to be that number one leader in face of the, the franchise, if you will. And, yeah, and just, I, I want to add something to that real quick, Bobby, if I can. That's why, and I'm not trying to take this from Quinn to Arch, but let's talk about the quarterbacks in general. That's why all these BS clickbait stories about Arch transferring, should he transfer. Look, just look at the look at the way the Mannings have handled this process. They're not in any rush with Arch. OK, and I think for a while, Quinn was in a rush. I think there's a rush to be a pro quarterback. It's so important to go as a quarterback to go through this whole learning process and developmental process. That's why all these BS clickbait stories about Arch really got under my skin is it, people that write this stuff. Have you followed the Mannings? I mean, so like and I, to my point, I think is is the world slowed down for Quinn and, and, and Quinn is so smart kid. His family's smart. They look around saying, hold on, we have to have patience with this process. Look, the Mannings are having pro patience with a process with Arch right now. There's a patience here at the quarterback position. I know in, in sports we want to rush guys to the finish line, but, man, offensive line, defensive line, and quarterback, you cannot rush those positions to the finish line. You just can't do it. I will, I will add this, and I thought this was interesting. He confirmed our report. Uh, at, the, at the very first uh, outset of the, the press conference that he held here, and we're in the actual room that they had it, uh, uh, steps away uh, from uh, the uh, Mon Creek Blue House athletic facility. Jerry, one of the things he said uh, was, I in the offseason, I talked to some people around me that said, you know what, let's have more starts. And we talked about that 25-game start period that, that showed that quarterbacks, that's what he talked about. You see, he, he met with people around him and really took that to heart and, and took it. Uh, right, another couple of things we need to mention, okay? He also had some things to say about the young receivers, Jerry, uh, specifically. Um, not, it wasn't a lot. Like, he didn't go on and on or, or whatever, but here's what I had. Isaiah Bond, he called explosive. Yes. I'm just going to use the one word. Matthew <laughs> Golden, great kick returner, soft hands. I thought that was interesting. DeAndre Moore, clearly one of his best friends, it sounds like. It just says he loves him great. He said Jonte Cook's familiarity with the offense is showing up very yeah. strong. So of those four, go ahead. And I'll add to that. He said Jonte Cook's taking a leadership role in that wide receiving group as well as the guy with eight catches, the only eight amongst this room coming back from Quinn Ewers a year ago. Uh, I, I thought that was very interesting. Quinn mentioned himself, aside from him, Jake Majors in the front of that offensive line. And John T. Cook, another guy to be uh, at least aware of as a leader in this room. He, he mentioned Cedric Baxter as a leader too, by the way, Jerry. Oh, Cedric Baxter is a leader. Yeah, I mean, look, we let's go back to go back to Cedric Baxter, Bob. Remember when we had to did a show, and Cedric Baxter was out with a minor hamstring tweak. I was in Edgewater High School. And we did a show, and I was like, this guy was in the huddle every single play of a practice while he was out with a slightly pulled hamstring. 
That's not – a lot of five stars don't do that now. A lot of number one ranked running backs in the country don't do that. And we talked about his leadership back then. So Cedric Baxter, that doesn't surprise either one of us because we have we had talked about that for over a year with that kid coming out of high school. And the coach at Edgewater oftentimes said, unbelievable leader. So Cedric's got that humility um, and almost that life experience a little bit, but he's he's just got a natural feel and understanding uh, for leadership. But the interesting thing about what uh, Quinn said about Jonte, guys, is that's what we've talked about with Ryan Wingo. That The biggest adjustment at, for in uh, playing receiver in Steve Sarkeesian's scheme isn't route running. It, it, it isn't all the nuances of the position. You can get guys up to speed, especially early in roles. You can get those guys prepared. It's everything pre-snap that goes into this offense. And that's where Jonte's growth had to come. And that's what, what we'll be watching for with Ryan Wingo. How quickly does that accelerate in his process? Because it took Jonte some time, and it takes a lot of receivers some time. Uh, so that'll be interesting to watch with Ryan Wingo kind of piggybacking off of what Quinn said about Jonte. Yeah, one interesting note, Quinn said he's at right around 205. Wants to yep. get up to 210. Yep. Uh, you know, I, I think that's a good weight for him. Uh, he talked about his pro day and being able to throw for the guys there. He really kind of – I wouldn't say brushed it off, but he gave the credit to what? the guys that were running the routes. The, uh, you know, he said, I was just the arm there, which I thought was a great answer from him. Uh, and one more fun note, you know, for those wondering if uh, the mullet's coming back to the SEC, <laughs> Quinn said it is not. No. Uh, and so we're, we're not going to see the, the golden mullet on, on Rocky Top anytime soon. The, I, I will say this, the, uh, the comment he made about the pro day was very smooth. Yeah. I, I look, I, I, I've covered Quinn since he's came come to Texas, and I've seen the uh, pro progress. We started this with this clip that I actually asked the question, what has your progress been, Quinn? And I, I feel like he's getting it. You know, first year, deer in headlights. Now, he was good. He steered the car, right? Got him into eight and five, et cetera. Second year, so much better, but still not perfect, not ideal for a – uh, as a guy as talented as he is, he could be, he could even be better, right? You got the feel that he start the, the wheels are in motion in his head, and he's seeing things, right? And that's that's going to be such a big deal. All right, hey, we we need to uh, change gears here a little bit. Uh, we've had two practices this week that we've had access to. Uh, Coach Sarkeesian been kind enough to do that for the media, uh, and so we, we could uh, give it give you all our thoughts. Overarching thoughts right now as far as practice. Manny Muhammad lingering hamstring. Freddie DeVos not really practicing. But other than that, relatively healthy. And Muhammad, it's just a tweak. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And so, look, I mean, if they can just stay healthy, keep getting reps, keep doing this stuff. I, I think health of the team, again, is a constant that has been pretty darn lucky, in my opinion. I would agree. You know, aside from really that one day in fall camp a few years ago when you lost two starters for practice, practice wise, this team in program, you know, keeps health at the utmost importance, which you can't ask for much more. No, it, it, it pays off on Saturdays. I mean, that's that's the reality of it. Uh, it it's, and that's one of those things. What, what are you thinking, Jerry? My big takeaway is offensive line and just how far the position has come. Uh, in a short amount, and it is a short amount of time. Again, it's not add water instant player here. You got to recruit and develop these guys. But just looking at the practice the other day and said, okay, and we saw talked about this morning on Coffee and Football, Bobby. Six years ago, you couldn't entertain the thought of moving Hayden Connor out of left guard. You couldn't, it, Cole Hudson would have come back from injury and been the starter again with no competition. I mean, th those two things alone. And, and how deep Texas is at the center position. There's been years where you wondered if the center was 275 pounds and how he could hold up. And gosh, if this guy went down, I mean, who are they going to, who's going to snap a football, right? I mean, there were those years on the offensive line at Texas. And you think about that with Daniel Cruz coming in and looking good as a freshman, <clears throat> you know, in Connor Robertson and Hayden Connor even is taking uh, some snaps at center now and Jake Majors back. You don't have to play Cole Hudson at center. You don't have to force an issue. Kyle Flood doesn't have to force any issue. And he's got a bunch of guys who are going to be drafted one day. But it's a great place to be when you're not having the square peg round hole. And you're not having to just give guys positions after they come back from injury. This Jeremy, is a very competitive offensive line room. And I think the uh, 
I, I think the all the re- talent they've recruited is starting to rise. So I'm going to say this. So I have second second practice to watch for me this this uh, this go round uh, for spring ball. You are not wrong about the offensive line because they have the high end and the depth. Yeah. Okay. The thing that is striking about me is depth generally. So I could I sat there and watched the defensive end group. There's three, four, maybe five NFL players in the defensive end group all, all, all together. There's two or three in the linebacker room. There's three or four in the corner slash safety room at least. Maybe more if I sat here and tried to dial it out in my head, right? Defensive tackle, other than Alfred Collins right now, and maybe Alex January, I don't know that there's a future NFL player. Now, Vernon Broughton, maybe, as a, as a, as a you know, guy that makes a roster. But my point being, it is across the board. That's my overarching take. Yes, uh, wins back, n- very few injuries, new receiver group, all this other stuff, depth. One to 85 is better than it's been on the UT campus since 05. I truly believe that. I mean, I, I think 1 to 85, it's the deepest team they've had. Is it going to be as good as last year or even as good as 09 or 08? Let's see. But I, I'll it. say this. I'll say this, though. I, I'm on record. This is going to be the fastest Texas team in 20 years. I, I really believe that. Uh, you know, look. That national championship team had five DBs that went in the NFL, four first rounders, right? Those that was a very fast football team. Uh, I mean, at, at all positions, uh, realistically, I think this is going to be the fastest one through eighty-five football team that Texas has had in twenty years. On top of you know what we see on the field, I think they're getting it right inside the facility as well. You know, just listening to Quinn and David Benda today. You know, they're not looking ahead to the SEC. They're not worried about the outside noise of Quinn coming back and what's Arch doing. You know, they, they basically said, you know, we got close and we know it's on us to get over that bump and get to back to where we want to be, regardless of what other independent variables that are thrown their way right now. So uh, the mindset, mindset to me, at least, I think they've got it right between the ears. Yep. All right. Before we have one last question, I want to say thanks one last time. Uh, to Adam Lowy in the Lowy Law Firm. Uh, visit him at lowylawfirm.com. 20 plus years experience helping injured uh, parties in car wrecks, automobile accidents, uh, get uh, compensation that they are due. That's lowylawfirm.com. Adam, we appreciate your sponsorship of on I just want to say this. If all of the Texas Tech Nation didn't call Adam Lowy after that 57-7 this year, I don't know what they're talking about. because That was a bunch of injured people. <laughs> there, there were some injured hearts for yes. Texas Tech fans. Yeah, does Adam Lowry, Lowry, does he, can he help your broken heart? I'm surprised Brett Yormark didn't call him after the, the video board, too, by the way. <laughs> uh, hey, the, 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 the next thing and I, I, final thing I want to talk about here is um, where they go from here. It sounded to me of everything today, it sounds like they're still working on getting that timing down with the quarterbacks and receivers. Yep. That felt right and they're still working on maybe what exactly the front looks like right now when you add a tray more to it when colton Vosick gets healthy what's that front going to look like uh long term those are probably the two things i'm looking to see what happens practice six seven eight nine and i'll even add to that you know is it going to be anthony Hill or is it going to be david benda you know kind of being that communication guy in the middle Cartesian on Monday, you know, fortunately, they don't have to play tomorrow. So they get all of spring, all of summer and fall camp to kind of tweak these little nuances and and, and put that best product on the field. Because, again, like you said, the pieces are there. It's all about kind of finding the right fit. David Benda. By the way, you know, it's been a great uh, week in spring practice, the first five practices. We don't even mention Bird Auburn. OK, but uh, hey, we're, Texas is still solid at kicker. OK, but we just don't see it. And there's so much talent in the program right now. Look, it wasn't that long ago where people were like, how did Michael Dixon kick the ball, punt the ball today? Because that was the highlight. We're not there anymore. I, I want to say this. Benda did say in the presser today that it's possible, possible 
that Anthony Hill is the one with the headset on. So that it's not Binda, but, but Anthony Hill. Furthermore, Sark had said maybe it's Jade Barron and it's that star position. So we'll see. Uh, that may be something to follow into fall and what they end up deciding. I'll say this. If Anthony Hill gets that call from the Texas staff, that means uh, mentally he's ahead of 99.999% of football players because he's a sophomore linebacker that they move around. Yep. And Stand if they can put that much, yeah, if they can put that much on his plate, then that's saying something for his mental. Yep. Stamp, stamp of approval. Ben to call him a smart kid today at the present. All right, that's going to do it for the state of the program. We'll be back later tonight with the uh, live stream. Uh, we've got uh, myself, uh, Rod Babers will be there as well. CJ will be alongside. We'll talk a little bit more about practice, everything else going on. Uh, probably some basketball news going to be breaking here in a little bit, uh, but uh, we'll get going from there. Uh, for Jerry Hampton and CJ Vogel, special thanks to Adam Lowy and the Lowy Law Firm. I'm Bobby Burton. That's been this week's State of the Program. Book it.